Jordan, a precious area of our planet with a number of jewels, still surviving from what we claim is a lost antiquity, Baalbek, with megaliths which, if not in perfect placements, would simply be unimaginable as the ancient objects used to create these enormous temple complexes, littered with numerous blocks estimated at well over 1,000 tons in size. It is a site whose explanation for construction is, predictably, avoided by modern archaeology. Although once dismissed by academics as immovable, the stone of the pregnant woman, for example, has since, due to more modern digging, been proven to, in fact, be merely a block part of another temple, which is now still mostly buried under millennia of strata. Another incredible find, and one that pushes the sizes of what these ancient civilizations were capable of, is an enormous stone upart, known as the Colossal Hand of Hercules. Excavated in Amman, and due to the find's proximity to what is now known as the Temple of Hercules, it is now thought to have been a hand of a gargantuan marble statue of Hercules himself. However, regardless of identity, when one begins to estimate the past size of the statue in relation to the hand, the statue itself would have been many, many thousands of tons in weight, undoubtedly towering into the sky. There exist many legends of statues built in many other parts of the world, some in docklands, some in capital ancient cities, some toppled, such as the obelisk of Aksum, again over the thousand tons in weight mark, and many unfinished. Yet this statue would have dwarfed all in size. And the fact that it was found in Jordan, a boiling pot for unexplained antiquity. A simply gigantic stone megalithic site, its discovery is made all the more intriguing and we feel can be legitimately used to argue, or rather push the capability of this lost civilization's capabilities of moving ancient stones even more advanced and astonishing in capability. Unfortunately, we feel due to the sheer age of the statue and the fact that it lived through a catastrophe of global proportions, only this fragment of hand and a portion of the elbow exists, subsequently found at the site. But reiterating the sheer size of other artifacts at the site, again gives credence to the past existence of a complete statue. And regardless of whether it was indeed once of the mythological character Hercules. We find the hand, and indeed its possible origins, as highly compelling. There has been a lot of incorrect information shared over the years in reference to the Mayan calendar and what exactly it predicted. Although a number of sources claimed that the end of the calendar indicated an apocalyptic event, the truth of the calendar's accuracy is, regardless, incredibly impressive. A calendar that tracks solar events and cyclical solar eclipses, along with the infamous hieroglyphic book known as the Dresden Codex, in which has now become known as the Lunar Table, documented an 11,959-day cycle, which are subdivided into groups each of which accurately predicts solar eclipses and other celestial events far into the distant future. What's more, no one knows how old the calendar is, even academically believed to have predated the Mayan civilization, merely adopted due to its incredible insight, with it being even more accurate than modern-day calendars to as much as ten-thousandth of a degree. Of all ancient calendar systems, the Maya and Mesoamerican systems were the most intricate. The calendar used a 20-day month and had two years within our own modern calendar year, known as the 260-day sacred round or Tzolkin. But it also included the 365-day cycle, known to them as the vague year or Hab. The 52-year period of time was to them known as the bundle and meant the same to the Maya as our century does to us. The two calendars would then coincide every 52 years. The reason for this 
is so far unknown. Although, it must be noted, the Dogon tribe claimed to have been visited by extraterrestrial beings from twin stars near Sirius, a claim astronomically confirmed several decades after this was documented, with a celebration taking place every 60 years, which does indeed match a full orbit of these stars, something that, to them, should have been impossible to have known. But I digress. No one is certain how such an unusual calendar came into being. Although the 260-day cycle may tie several celestial events together, with Mars, appearances of Venus, or eclipse seasons all logged as possibilities. It may also represent the interval between conception and the birth of children, used to determine important activities related to the gods. It was undoubtedly believed in, used to name individuals, predict the future, decide on auspicious dates for battles, marriages, and so on. The sacred round is composed of two smaller cycles, with the numbers 1 through 13, coupled with 20 different day names. Each of the day names is represented by a god who carries time across the sky, thus marking the passage of night and day. Some of these being animal gods, with archaeologists pointing out that the sequence of animals matches sequences of the modern zodiac which was also used in many other ancient civilizations worldwide. The question is, where did all this knowledge come from? Or indeed, where did it go? Although it did not predict an apocalypse as many claimed, we find this ancient cyclical calendar highly compelling. Guatemala, littered with ancient wonders, temples, which pierce its dense canopy, all once declared as separate structures. Modern technology, however, has shown that these structures, mostly now submerged by dense undergrowth, was once one huge mega-metropolis, with Tikal in particular also once containing a plaque displaying a great deluge, with the site submerged in what is depicted as a cataclysm, with a volcanic eruption also in the background of said image. With mysterious megaliths still found littering the foliage, one site in particular, it would seem, evaded destruction, and the subsequent rainforest's creeping grip which has consumed much of this enormous ancient site. Known as Kirigua, it remains virtually untouched, yet the most intriguing thing regarding this site, apart from its superb preservation, are the enigmatic stone carvings not only found at the site but throughout the jungle itself. Statues and megaliths, presumably often depicting queens and kings in strained contraptions, seemingly familiar in form to modern vehicles or the interiors of an aircraft. Once claimed as mere signposts, the sheer abundance of these mystifying tributes, however, now makes this explanation unlikely for even if merely artistically inspired, what do they depict? Why would an ancient civilization show such passion in casting these particular-looking technological devices into massive stones all over the Guatemala rainforest? With Kirigua thankfully so well preserved, we can explore a number of these baffling carved megaliths in detail. Were they trying to tell future generations something? Did they find something crashed within the forest, possibly documenting a find and proposed purposes upon these stones? Did they witness a form of craft take to the air and seemingly into the heavens? Could this have been the inspiration for why leaders of these tribes would want to be immortalized in carved, similar-appearing machines, in the hope of eternal life or indeed a craft capable of transporting them into the heavens? Vast questions still surround this ancient civilization's knowledge, 
one now known to have been over 10 million strong. Did this enormous, once incredibly powerful ancient civilization get visited by beings from another planet? Possibly found a crashed craft? One they attempted to depict a reverse engineering of? The fact that many depict what modern man would perceive as complex craft concepts, many find highly intriguing. We also find these massive stone megaliths, the efforts undoubtedly applied to create them, their source inspiration, and indeed the images they depict by a civilization we now know were undeniably advanced and extremely ancient, once lost for millennia and only now being rediscovered highly compelling. The megalithic marvels of lore, very rarely studied, academically explored or publicized, yet regardless of this, remains one of the most curious and intriguing ruins of the Neolith Menhir age. Not only still in existence, but with many Menhir still erect, still standing tall across the landscape to this day a legacy left to us by a now lost civilization. A collection of curious, kooky, and oftentimes mischievously graffitied prehistoric menhirs. The menhirs were often elaborately carved, and due to the unexplainable scale of some of the stones, cut, quarried, and eventually raised along the valley, it is clearly an example of an inexplicable ruin an ancient relic left to us, once created using unknown technologies at an unknown time within history. A now lost, yet once highly advanced ancestor. Impossible for the current academically claimed culture, which is clearly a fallacy within modern paradigm. Some of the inexplicably huge stones incorporated into these sites are now being found scattering our planet. Like that of the Plain of Jars located in Laos. An unusual, enigmatic site we have also covered in the past, possesses stonework from megalithic blocks of inexplicable sizes. These gigantic stone carvings, menhirs and jars, some still in astonishing conditions, are a testament to what our lost ancestors were once capable of, and due to the immense size of the stones they could control, have successfully left their mark far into an unknown future are present. The channel feels a duty, clearly as a far less capable civilization, that we do not withhold the evidence for their existence which has been a great disservice to those who deserve the truth. Multi-ton menhirs are located all across the Bada Valley, but not just the Bada Valley. Menhirs can be found across the globe, located in many countries, even in New Zealand in Rodney County. The erosion of many of the world's menhir stonework, we feel, is indicative of incredible aging, and as such, possibly from the same era as the Bada Valley's mysterious menhirs. Yet regardless of whoever made these sculptures, there will never be any academically admittance to the evidence that these particular stoneworkings are found all over the planet. Yet regardless of anyone's opinions regarding their past use, a function undertaken at a time so long ago, we may never know the true purpose of what our distant ancestors may have been trying to tell us all those millennia ago, only time will tell. The menhirs and the hinges found worldwide, many now widely known about, have blown a few holes into the hull of the sinking ship that is academic paradigm. The fact that these menhirs are no less common and no less scattered across the globe merely lays another nail in the coffin for the timelines academia put forward for the migrations of man, and even our beginnings, for to have these unusual megaliths everywhere, their builders must have been everywhere too. A highly advanced, highly capable, once world-going ancient civilization an extremely long time ago. One which we find highly compelling. In our last video, we explored the work of the first pioneering antiquarians of the modern age. We discussed how archaeologists Arthur Poznanski and Neil Steed, along with many other astute individual researchers, unraveled a possible key to unlocking the true purpose and indeed historical significance of the site. 
They concluded that the site, due to academia's reluctance to tag any ancient ruin with a date of more than 4,000 years, is the oldest ruin on Earth. The archaeologists discovered an alignment with the solstices and spring equinox, which only occurred around 17,000 years ago. However, there are many other intriguing areas of interest yet to be fully understood. Along with the volumes of photographic documentations of precise measurements, independent researchers also discovered that the site's gray stonework also possesses a curious magnetic property. The question is, if these ancient people knew of this interesting characteristic, what was the purpose of using said stone? Was the stone slowly magnetized by a technology once present at the site, now lost to history? Along with the gray stone, however, the site also contains an equal amount of red sandstone, which was used to build the site, yet this red stone does not share the enigmatic magnetism of its gray counterpart. Perhaps the sandstone is somehow immune to what was responsible. Perhaps this is why the Great Pyramids were built from sandstone, to avoid the masonry taking on this magnetic charge. Perhaps, but I digress. Puma Punku is what we like to call a smoking gun, a site which clearly displays masonry skills of its ancient constructor, precision-cut stone masonry, which today could only be achieved with the use of advanced stone-cutting machinery. Shrouded in mystery, the archaeological side of Puma Punku is one of the biggest headaches for mainstream archaeology to explain. So how would an ancient culture, one which was far less capable than modern man, cut, shape, and transport from many miles away, carvings out of some of the world's toughest stone accomplished with such incredible precision? A group able to transport blocks of stone, sometimes weighing far more than 50 tons to the site, effortlessly placing them in position, often using a placement technique indicative of polygonal methodology. Interestingly, after investigating possible causes for this characteristic, it was realized that the building material was not granite, as it had long been assumed, but was in fact andesite. Andesite is the most iron-rich volcanic material we are aware of. It can contain around 15% iron oxide, and can have up to 4% magnetite. Thus, the stone, it seems, could have already been displaying magnetic characteristics when placed where it now lay. Yet the question still persists. Why did this stone get selected as the building material for the temple? It was built by a civilization that brought the stone from many miles away, so the suggestion that it was the only stone available would not be a logical conclusion. It was chosen by a group who were seemingly meticulous in their application. So it is quite possible that the magnetic characteristic was somehow utilized by the builders. Thankfully, it is only a matter of time before Puma Punku's secrets are fully understood, and we finally discover who built it. It is a place we find highly compelling.